on the show with me today is Michael Kester. Yeah, really happy to be here. Really excited to talk about uh, some, uh, I don't know, what, mindfuck thought they were horror, turns out they're thriller movies. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely a, a pleasant surprise. Uh, doing The Killing Room and Triangle today. Triangle. No, uh, no, uh, fuck, what's that called? It's article. A, it's no a, article it's article before yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, no, the, just Triangle. What is this, 2009, I think is the... Uh, yeah. Yeah, well, everybody's already watched the Triangle miniseries on accident uh, last week. Sorry about that. It is actually the 2009 film, Triangle. But The oh Killing God, Room... there's a miniseries? Oh, you didn't know about this? No. Yeah, it's... Um, Long. It's one of those sci-fi ones. I found it actually after doing The Lost Room, which was this thing that happened on the sci-fi channel that I thought was so fucking cool. So I went and looked for their other... You know, they did a... I think it's called The Tin Man... And they did uh, an Alice in Wonderland thing, and they did a Bermuda Triangle thing, which okay. they called the Triangle. All right. But that's not what we're doing today. We're just doing the 2009 film, Triangle. And we are going to spoil it. We're going to spoil that and The Killing Room. We're going to tell you what happens if we understand what happens. Uh, how, how good of a handle do you think you have on these two movies? Um, I think I have a better handle on The Killing Room than Triangle. Uh, because I feel like The Killing Room is more of a pragmatic film than Triangle. Sure. Um, but spoilers abound, nonetheless. Oh, they, Even they, if it's misinformation spoilers. From from the very beginning of both films, you will get spoiled. All right, so go ahead and use the chapters in uh, in this here show, and skip over the movie you haven't seen yet. Skip The Killing Room if you haven't seen it. Skip Triangle. Definitely see the movies. Don't spoil yourself on these, because I think... Uh, a really big piece of it is the, oh my God, what the hell is happening? Yeah. And uh, with that, we start The Killing Room, which is a momentous occasion on a Double Feature. Yeah, it is. For a couple of reasons, but one is for our Kickstarter. Yeah. This is the, uh, I think this is the first time so far uh, in Double Feature history, not even just year six, but Double Feature history that someone has suggested a film and we have done it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, perhaps, uh, perhaps fittingly, if you'll remember, we did do The Killing and Mary and Max. Oh, that's right. Way back. That was more of a raffle type situation. It was uh, a bunch of people recommended movies, and we picked two of them. This is the first time it's just blood money. It's just someone handed us a $100 bill, and we have placed their film on the show. Right. And so that is Ben Eckert today, who I wanted to thank a ton for uh, backing our Kickstarter. You know, we only had maybe 120 people who backed it. Right. So the fact people gave us outrageous amounts of money, uh, each person, I mean, clearly we're thankful for everybody who helped out. But it means a big fucking deal that people have been asking us for so long to put their goddamn movie on the show mm -hmm. that they were willing to pop down 100 bucks for it right? Uh, to hear us talk about it. So this also means one of two things. It means that the, uh, the film the person picked is either their favorite film in the whole goddamn world, or we've already covered all of their <laughs> favorite movies of all time. So um, that's going to make doing all these movies really, really interesting, is to think this person could only recommend really one film. We took uh, basically everybody's primary recommendation, unless it conflicted with another person's recommendation, and we're putting that on the show. Today, that is The Killing Room. There's a really big question lingering at the front of this that oh, I'm hoping yeah. you can kind of help with. You mean in the title cards at the very, very beginning of the film? Yeah. Before we get to double feature notable reason number two, Project MK Ultra. Yeah, Project MK Ultra. That was a thing. <laughs> Back in the 50s and 60s and 70s and when everybody was afraid of Russia, 80s too. Sure. During the Cold War, Russia being the other global superpower, against the United States, 
everything was a race. You know, we've heard the arms race and the space race, and everything is just mm-hmm. Russia's going to get to space first. And whose postal division can send mail using rockets? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And eventually, different weird things would trickle through various spy grapevines and say Russia's developing uh, telepathy, and they're gonna, they're gonna, you know. There were actually documented cases of scientists trying to uh, use people as psychics in order to find bomb and criminal locations. Yeah. It was just a weird thing that everybody, I, you know, probably because it was the, uh, the 60s generation all still having acid flashbacks trickling back right. into the 80s. Right. Um, they... Uh, did all these experiments mk ultra was was fairly early on but through all of it they did a bunch of experiments testing the length of the human mind and, right and how far it could go and then you know obviously trying to weaponize it um and there's a that movie the men who stare at goats sure is a movie about that it's about the division of people trying to you know use their mind for psychic warfare Mm -hmm. and mk ultra was the official unofficial project of psychic and uh telepathic warfare against the reds back in the cold war era and uh i mean it is documented whether or not it it actually happened or whether or not it was the extent that everybody's gonna speculate that's the patriot act right sure uh which which we get don't we we get that in this movie right yeah someone says the, uh, the comparison someone says doop doop doo oh, what is this, Patriot Act? Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's so interesting to think about the men who stare at goats uh, against this movie because the men who stare at goats, especially the film version. Yeah. You know, there's the original John Ronson book, but the, the film particularly is very, it's very much a comedy. It is. And it's got some heavy parts to it, but it's looking at this from a very lighthearted side where the killing room is... Looking at it from a very, very dark side. Well, I feel like the lighthearted look that the men who stare at goats takes is the look that someone like you and I would immediately get when someone says, you know, back in the day, right. the government was trying to train psychic soldiers and you and I would be like, oh, so they were like running into walls and shit. Sure, sure. <laughs> yeah, because people do not have psychic powers. Right. So <laughs> when you test the, you know, the extent of the human mind, you find that it's uh, it's pretty much not yeah. With psychic. The extent ends before psychic abilities begins. But there's another component to this that the killing room kind of brought up that I haven't thought a lot about is, you know, we just think about uh, Project MK Ultra as that time people tried to send mind beams to knock over goats. Right. And how silly that was. But there's also uh, this sort of endurance and torture aspect of it. And a lot of this is unknown, and you and I know even less than what the public has been disclosed on. Mm-hmm. I mean, by right. documents are out there, we haven't read them, so you're getting this from a friend of a friend of a friend at this point. But uh, I've been reading about this a bit after seeing the movie, and a lot of the ties to, like you are talking about, LSD and, and so forth. And it also seems that, you know, we were using the alleged psychic phenomena as one potential means of understanding more psychologically about people. Mm -hmm. We were looking to gain confessions out of people. We were looking at brainwashing. The line really becomes blurry between, you know, we think about it like James Randi's Million Dollar Challenge. Right. But I think it's a lot closer to waterboarding. It's a lot closer to, you know, if we torture these people to death, what, what kind of things... Sure. might happen what sort of other mechanisms can we use psychologically it's if we push them to the ends of their physical limits it will open their mental faculties right right uh, so if we give them a long questionnaire and uh, stick them in a fluorescent glass chamber sure eventually they will become suicide bombers yeah and that's you know the suicide becoming suicide bombers or willing to die for your country or torturing people to a certain point also seems like that was an honest part of MK Ultra. Sure. And there's also a line of reasoning that suggests that uh, all of the crazy goat stuff was sort of, you know, what the public latched onto 
and what the media latched onto, and perhaps the uh, the focus on the unwilling participant has been kind of swept under the rug. That that might have right. been a brutal part of it and an honest part of it too. Mm-hmm. But it's funnier to talk about goats, and it's easier, and so that's you know that's right. what we know about the the project. It's probably the most we'll ever be able to talk about it, except maybe doing the men who stare at goats, right? W- which might be the totally the other side. These guys are participating in this project in the movie for two hundred and fifty dollars. You can't even do your own podcast for that amount of money. No. Yet we get uh, Peter Stormare to show up and Chloe Savini and Clea Duvall. Poor Clea Duvall. Neither you nor I had seen this film, and it's it's uncommon that a film that neither you nor i have seen ends up on double feature right it does happen we never tell anybody about it but (laughs) it does happen sure and uh i'm watching this and and you know we're not actually sitting next to each other so i can't just kind of watch your reaction and gauge it (laughs) so i'm sitting i'm sitting watching this and uh the film's unfolding and everything's interesting and we get this cast of characters that i'm already kind of drawn to because we get Shea Wiggum, who I really like from, he's, uh, he's from Machete and he's in uh, Boardwalk Empire. Mm-hmm. And then the ones you named, Chloe Savini, Peter Stormare, Clay Duvall. Uh, I mean, the cast is really solid in this film. Yeah. Within maybe 10 minutes, um, I'm interested at what's going on. Everything seems like there's a lot of intrigue and this is going to unfold in a fascinating way. And I'm like, oh man, this is going to be a good movie for double feature. You got that constant music going, like right. you walked in on the middle of something, you're playing catch up. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of mystery to it. And they shoot Clay Duvall in the head. <laughs> and immediately I say out loud, Eric's not going to like this. <laughs> Eric's done. Up, oh, they made Eric mad. <laughs> So, you know, I love Clay Duvall, and I feel bad for her because she can't stay in a fucking movie for more than 10 minutes. Yeah, uh, yeah but she, she disappears, and that's the, you know, that's the movie stepping up and going, anything could happen. We just shot one of the five people. And this is one of the, uh, the things that's going to make it a lot different than some of the films that you might compare this to. We've been talking on the show a lot about these uh, kind of trapped in a place movies that we love to cover. Mm -hmm. And um, you've been referring to them in a certain way off the show that I thought it was it was time to finally bring on to the show. Yeah. The uh, the fluorescent bottle film. Yeah. (laughs) Well, as (laughs) a bottle film. Yeah. Sure. Let's start with the bottle film. Yeah. It's a it's a movie uh, where all the characters and most entirely the action takes place in one place and everybody has no idea what the hell is going on <laughs> right right which comes from the the television concept sure the bo- a, bottle episode right like fly from breaking bad or any of the episodes of community where they say bottle episode <laughs> right <laughs> right and i don't know if community coined that i think that probably no. uh i think that's sort of an industry thing but you know you can make a cheap episode of uh of television that doesn't fit in your normal continuity and there's a lot of reasons to do that. Film doesn't do that nearly the same way. Right. It's not as if there's a serialized amount of film episodes and one of them is a, a sort of one-off. But to think about films that are entirely in a bottle, almost ship in a bottle style. Right. Everything is going to take place in this one location, this one room. And uh, they're the type of movies that really appeal to the minimalist. Mm -hmm. Um, That's sort of part of my brain. I think that's why we end up seeing a lot of them on the show. They're nice to deconstruct because there's very few components. All the components are very heightened. So everything is given very careful consideration. Each new item or person that enters into the equation is a piece of the puzzle. You don't get a lot of background characters or uh, wallpaper in these movies. The things like in this movie, the bolted down chairs, mm-hmm. very simple thing. You come in, the chairs are bolted down. Normally that would just be a piece of the setting piece of the backdrop. But uh, in here, the fact that they're bolted down, that's not really so much what's weird as that they're bolted down askew. Right. You know, they're in these, uh, the tables are misaligned. The chairs are misaligned. It plays into this idea that this is a psychological experiment. Mm-hmm. We're trying to replicate this down to, you know, every single chair, being, everything being meticulous. And so bottle films might be something like Buried or Pool, 
and we've talked about the reasons to keep those trapped in a place. But you actually, not only are we going to introduce the term bottle film this episode, but you have a, a, a sort of subgenre title for this particular type of bottle yeah, film. Yeah, I, uh, I called it a fluorescent bottle film. So how would you differentiate that from the, say, Pawnee Pool? Well, I think a fluorescent bottle film is a film where you're in, I mean, you're in a single room and there's some sort of test or trial going on. Sure. And there's fluorescent lighting. And everybody's kind of, everybody looks at the ceiling and screams. (laughs) Um, So at the risk of comparing this to the other films, which I'm going to backpedal on uh, immediately after, uh what else on our show would you say? Oh, definitely, probably the first Saw movie has a very fluorescent bottle film thing. Cube, it's another one. Cube was, yeah, another one. I know you and I have talked about the movie that we saw on Netflix called The Exam. Yeah. When we were trying to figure out, this is another interesting thing about these these listener picked movies is we don't really know how to pair them because we don't know what they are. Right. So we hear the killing room, and you know it becomes that question of how much do we find out about this movie? We kind of risk ruining the surprise versus make a good double feature. Mm-hmm. So you know when we get far enough in the synopsis to go, eh, the cover wants us to believe it's Saw, right? And they're all in a place. Uh, I don't know. Okay, triangle. Yeah. And so that's, you know, that's about what we start with. But I think uh, there's a couple things in this movie that make it stand out from the subgenre of the Cube and Saw sure. sort of movies. And one is that dark control room. Yeah. You know, you say fluorescent bottle film, and we use that to kind of joke about the look of Saw and the exam and so forth. But also the fact they're in a dark room does sort of seem pretty different than these other uh movies yeah you know you have something like when we when we watch the first saw movie Mm -hmm. big white room guy on the floor dead pool of blood you know it's a it's a certain type of aesthetic to this test environment that these people are put in but then to actually see stuff from the control room to see the people observing almost just as much as the people inside the room it's kind of a peek behind the curtain, I think, that's a little different than these other movies. Especially something like Cube, where the peek behind the curtain is sort of the, the end objective of yeah. wh- what are we doing here? How do we find out? Is there anything outside this room? Right. It's the goal. One of the things for me that, that I thought this film was really strong in doing is that with something like Saw and something like Cube, you get the whole idea of well cube especially you're wondering who's in power and who's right making this work and with saw you get a huge focus on the you know jigsaw yeah you know who's who's doing this (laughs) sure and here you get an interesting blend of both because you get to see some of the higher ups in the company right and you know they're they're government unaffiliated which may or may not mean they're entirely <laughs> government affiliated right but i think the most interesting aspect to me is the uh the loudspeaker oh sure and it's the kind of thing it's subtle it's not something the film is calling attention to all the time but if you're listening to the voices over the loudspeaker you get this sense of extreme manipulation yeah. beyond something like cube and beyond something like saw and beyond something like examine even um nothing remember when we did nothing yeah yeah this is a film where everything every character in the bottle is doing is being manipulated and facilitated by the people outside the bottle sure it's almost an interesting juxtaposition against what they're claiming is the goal yeah because they're making them do all this shit to see what they're going to do, but they rarely provide them with enough time to act on free will. Sure. It's always, oh, they're, they're starting to act on free will. Turn on the, turn on the Iraqi voices. <laughs> turn on the Iraqi voices. <laughs> right. They're starting to think about something. Well, yeah, I think that feeds into the big kind of twist of the movie is that this isn't just a test. It's not setting it up to go, you know, we want to find out about the participants or test them. It's more that we're trying to train them. We're trying to indoctrinate them. We're trying to see. We do want to find out if one is a potential candidate. Mm -hmm. But uh, as of the end of the movie with, um, you know, the phase two reveal illustrates, it's all about, well, yeah, this this kind of 
brainwashing is going to work on one particular individual. So we'll go forward with that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, they don't want to move too far out of their scenario. They're trying to keep everything, you know, they're trying to to keep the test case in place as best they can. They only have one thing to test against and they want to make sure everybody adheres to it. Mm -hmm. I also think that there's kind of a lie about all of these movies in, uh, in the mystery over the characters. And I think the killing room might be the first one that doesn't, you know, fall into that. It's true to the, the exploitative way it brings people to the genre. When we talk about things like Cube, Cube is, you know, you want to come on the show and talk about what is the Cube? Why are people in the Cube? But really, we're watching Cube, and we actually discussed the characters. That sure. was the real thing. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's the same with all of these movies. It's why are the people trapped in the place? What is the nature of the place? You know, it's a big mystery. But we don't ever talk about that mystery. We just, you know, we do John Carpenter's The Thing. Right. We watch a bunch of people strained in an environment. How are they <laughs> going to act out? What are they going to do? And The Killing Room... It doesn't fuck around with that stuff. Right. It goes, here's five characters, whoops, I mean four characters, and uh, we're going to kill that. You know, it talks about there's going to be a test, and every test we're going to kill a person. Right. There's only three people in the room, (laughs) you know? (laughs) This isn't going to be the repetitious test after test after test. We hear about all these questions, and there's really only two questions. We're just killing people and getting it over with. But the film does some interesting things in in, in baiting you, Mm -hmm. because... There, are, I mean, there are viewers who are going to, you know, be like, there are four phases and immediately yeah. the viewer is going to go, there's four people. Yeah. So absolutely. it's going to be one person for face. I got this. One person's going to die each time. You think you know the blueprint. Right. Well, and, and the thing for me that I thought, I thought I was so smart. <laughs> the first question where it's like, uh, what is it? The number Americans all say on average. What number does an average American yeah. pick? Yeah. So I'm sitting here going, everybody should just say the same number. Yeah. And, You're uh, trying to trick it because you think yeah. this is even fucking about the questions. Yeah. I'm thinking I'm thinking if you all say the same number, you're going to trick the machine. And they're like, it's seven, it's 17, it's 37. No, that's outside 33. Yeah. And I'm, I'm, I'm going, you should all say the same number. And then the guy goes, we should all say the same number. And I was like, ha <laughs> I knew it. Because you're trying to play this like another sure. puzzle film. And then two of them say the same number and one of them blows it. And immediately I go, <laughs> oh, my idea would have worked. Yeah. But that guy had to go and blow it. And then they kill one of the guys who say the same number. <laughs> right. And immediately I go, I don't know what that means. Yeah. Right. Because if they had all said this, apparently seven is both the right and the wrong answer. Sure. And <laughs> the answer I would have picked as well, which I think is interesting. I just. That question came up and of course I try and answer the questions sure. like a fucking sucker. And then, and then you get the second question, which gives you the hint and you start going, oh yeah, because they're turning on each other and he's going to mislead him into saying a thing. And then the other guy's going to not say it. What? And then again, it's it's amazing because every time they ask them a question, I'm sitting there going, well, here's what I would do to get out of actually having to answer the question. Sure, here's what sure. I would do to beat it. And instead, every time they go, the answer doesn't matter, idiot. Yeah, right. <laughs> because the second time they they give you, they tell you flat out that the one character is about to say the wrong answer. But instead right. of even answering the question, he puts a gun in his mouth and then the other guy gets blown away. <laughs> And I'm sitting there going, but uh, why did I try to answer that again? (laughs) Right. I would be the dead guy in both situations. Yeah. And that's really the brilliant thing that the killing room does is uh, rather than shy away from, oh no, people are going to compare us to, you know, to saw. So we have to move away from that. Or people are going to compare us to cube. We're going to sit next to the exam on Netflix. It knows that these films are out there and exist and that people have played these mind games. Mm -hmm. So they're not just going to say, well, we want to make our version of Saw. They're going to go, well, when people watch Saw, what do they do in their head? Yeah. They try and play the traps. They try and play the games. They try and outsmart the movie. What if the whole twist on our movie is that it's not the answer a bunch of questions, get the test right so you can be the survivor movie that everybody thinks right. it is. It does the the brilliant thing of instead of instead of the audience playing the game, the film plays the audience because they're playing the game. Well right. And I think another really good example of that is, you know, you get to a point where you didn't realize that uh Chloe's character is watching tapes. Right. You know, it seems instantly obvious the second they mention it because you go, oh, we couldn't see them live in the room when She's standing up there. 
Or, you know, she walks in the room and I go, is Chloe's character part of the experiment? Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. She's the real candidate. I mean, right, this movie right. had this movie had me from the very beginning wrong at the top. In a movie where an audience is trying to figure out what's going on, making you feel like you couldn't get something as easy as, oh no, the first round was tapes. Yeah. What, weren't, you, weren't you paying attention? There's nobody in the fucking room, man. Yeah. We, we put you in the control center. There's nobody in there. Uh, it just makes you think it's going to get even harder than you ever imagined yeah. without the movie making the puzzle itself more convoluted. Right. It just shames you up front like, hey, stupid. Come on, pay attention. There's yeah. nobody in the room. So uh, what, should we move into phase two then? Yeah, thanks for that. The Triangle is a movie where you told me to know nothing going yes, in. That was your, uh, nothing. your direction. And I'm going to consider this having finally returned the favor for the time I gave you Primer. Yeah. So we're, <laughs> we're even on that. See, this is what I'm talking about on a heavy character movie, though, right? Yeah. Uh, trapped in one place, uh-huh. sort of, uh, kind of movie. But you get on this boat and all the characters don't know each other. We're exploring backstory. This girl's got a thing going on with her artistic son. And we're trying to introduce Heather, who matters for about five minutes of this film. Right. Uh, Before I go nuts about it, where the fuck did Heather go? I don't know. The whole time I'm going, Heather's going to come back. Heather's a part of this. Yeah. And you get to the end of the movie and no, Heather just fell off the fucking boat. And we don't know. Yeah. (laughs) She floated into the ocean and became irrelevant. Yeah. the, uh, The thing about Triangle is... I watched it with very little, um, very little idea of what I was gonna see. And That's whenever, the best. whenever I see a movie with the word triangle in it, <laughs> my initial gut reaction is, I bet this is about the Bermuda Triangle, and I bet it's awesome. Oh, see, I didn't think about that. Yeah. Even knowing about the fucking miniseries, I went, oh, the Bermuda Triangle. As soon as they get out yeah. in the ocean and the weather gets weird, I go, God damn it, the Bermuda Triangle. Yeah. I totally didn't even think about that. And the thing about the Bermuda Triangle for me is that, and I know we're we're skeptics on the show and we're reasonable human beings, but because the Bermuda Triangle is such this, uh, it's it's a it's a nebulous thing to debunk because you're not sure where the bunk lies in the Bermuda right, Triangle. Right, right. Because it's difficult to find out what people believe. Sure. Like something like ghosts. You and I can be like, well, a ghost is the spirit of a dead thing from a nether world that your parameters are there. Shakes your bedroom blinds. Right. Uh, that doesn't happen. But when you ask somebody, so what's the thing about the Bermuda Triangle? Oh, weird stuff happens there. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. So it's then, a, then what do it's I, a non-existent goalpost? What do I say? Uh, no, it does. I guess it does. Some. I would suppose it does. Ha- weird stuff happens everywhere. But I. Right, right. I mean, supernatural. But you're not claiming it's supernatural. Well, you're just claiming even, that it's bizarre. <laughs> even the lines for where is the Bermuda Triangle? <laughs> is it a triangle? Fuzzy. Where is Bermuda? Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> I do know that there are no higher instances of uh, vanished crafts or disasters or wreckage in the Bermuda Triangle than really anywhere else on Earth. It's pretty much all the same. Right. But that doesn't account for, but there's general weirdness. Like, right. I don't, I don't know what that is. And so I, I just do like the idea of there being this triangulation of ley lines on Earth where, sure. where weird stuff is definitely supposed to happen. And I'm not talking about Las Vegas. I'm talking about the Bermuda Triangle. <laughs> right. Um, well, the best part about that is you can study any, you know, mile by mile by mile triangle anywhere on Earth and find weird yeah. anomalies that yeah. happen in it. I just like that this one, this one is, the Bermuda Triangle has always been so strange to me because stuff will happen there and people will go, aha, Bermuda Triangle, need I say more? Right. And so there's <laughs> right. no further look into weird shit. Sure. And so there's always this idea that there are boats floating with no passengers out in the Bermuda <laughs> triangle and airplanes, just piles of them crashed into the sea. And there's a big hole to Mars in the sky there. And right. it's always been scary to me to think that you could just float into the Bermuda triangle on a big boat and then everybody just disappears. I, I rationalized it as a child uh, cause I was terrified of it. Um, by saying that there's probably a really cool island there and everybody goes there (laughs) and doesn't want to leave. Right. They just hang out. Um, The moment I knew this film was special was when we found ourselves aboard a giant abandoned boat. Yeah. You know, we're doing things that are obvious tributes to other films, 
it's a very familiar plot. It's, you know, a movie we put on the show because it's the type of familiarity we enjoy being oh, around. Yeah. And yet just the backdrop makes me feel like it's unlike anything I've ever seen before. Mm hmm. I think, oh, yeah, we're kind of doing, you know, The Shining, but right. we're doing it on a boat, so it's yeah. totally different. <laughs> and it is. You're 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 amazed how much that just sort of throws things off. Sure. At a high concept level, we're already doing something completely unique. And, uh, you know, when we find ourselves on the boat suddenly creeping around like The Shining or a, a Thai West film where everything's corridors, it's an extra level of... I don't know, intrigue or just enjoyment that I didn't even know. I didn't think, oh, we could do creepy hotel on a boat because that's what the giant boats are like. Yeah. So now I'm all sorts of excited. Well, and, and it automatically raises the question. The difference between creepy hotel and creepy boat is creepy hotel. Why are there no people? They must have walked away. Sure. <laughs> creepy right. boat is why are there no people and why are there no signs of people? Uh-huh. And well, then it becomes more like one of those earthbound space frigate yeah, type movies. Yeah, exactly. You know, like we yeah. talked about on Sunshine, which we never really make the comparison between these space frigates, the empty space frigate, and something like The Shining. Right. But uh, seeing them both kind of tied together here, I think it's possible. You know, we always say Hitchcock for those type of suspense-driven movies. Mm -hmm. But maybe we don't credit The Shining enough right. for these types of... Uh, Especially, you know, the go to theater room is 237. Yeah. You know, there's that whole kind of deliberate shining tie in sort sure. of inspiration there. And, um, you know, I think that probably inspires movies a little bit more than we consider. Mm -hmm. The go to theater thing is done on a mirror. There's a lot of mirrors in the movie, it's a big motif. Um, there's also the what I like to call the pile of Sally, which yeah, is one of my favorite images so from the whole movie. It's dark. I love yeah. it. Yeah. I don't know if it ever gets more, you know, the movie has a couple instances of these moments that I just love in cinema where there, you see a character's reaction shot and then you turn and the most fucked up thing a human being could imagine is on the other side. Yeah. Just something that's going to change. One image changes everything. Yeah. And seeing a pile of Sally's, one yeah. alive Sally crawling, dying through a pile of dead Sally's, you go, wow, this is... Yeah. I mean, this is something I kind of knew was happening once I got the plot of the movie. Yeah, but it's one of those things that you can't, I don't know. For me, the first person you see die mm -hmm. falls off the boat. Yeah. And you go, you know, there's only, there's not piles of bodies because they're falling off the boat or whatever. Right. And when right. they die, you, you think it's it's Goldeneye, right? You think it's those those old first person shooters where when there are too many too many enemies dead in a room, their bodies start to just disappear because there's not enough right. computing power to have a pile of them. <laughs> sure. And the Bermuda Triangle can't possibly have a high enough bit rate to have a pile of Sally's. Yeah, it's just something that awakens you to uh, something you probably already knew, but it makes it very tangible and very real when you see it. You suddenly go, yeah, it's as bad as I could have fucking imagined. It's worse. Um, there's a lot of little images through the movie that I like a lot. I think uh, that could possibly get lost in trying to figure out, you know, what's happening in the movie. And I don't want to overlook them. One of my favorite ones is the record player skipping. Yeah. I love the record player skipping because I think, you know, in the moment they show it right before they kind of cut to her and she's skipping and they really hammer it in. I, you know, I want to look at that now, having seen the entire movie and go, that's the most sure. overt metaphor. But I mean, I had my chance. When it was just a record player, yeah. I didn't make the connection. Right. I want to pretend like, come on, give your audience credit. But it's not until the record player starts skipping, and then they pause, and then she starts skipping. I go, oh, yeah, like a record. Yeah, no, I'm totally paying attention. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm totally smart enough for this. And that bit of knowledge comes in about we have to kill everyone, because when we kill everyone, it resets when right. they all die. Well, And that presents this really awesome thing for me, because... When she's running around the boat and she sees herself killing people, mm -hmm. you're in the mindset and she's in the mindset, well, that will never be me. That's some yeah. weird person right. that's killing people right. rampantly and they're horrible and I need to make sure that that I stop It'll that person. It'll never come to this. Because yeah. this, this is horrible and for some reason somebody's stolen my face and they're killing my friends and oh my God, I have to kill my friends. Yeah, right. Okay, I need to start killing my friends, but I'm going to be trying to stop myself, so I need to be ahead of me. Right. Right. 
I think it's one of the amazing powers of narrative filmmaking is that we root for our timeline's character. Right. <laughs> In reality, this is not the first or last Jess, but it's right. our Jess. Yeah. So when she's running away from people, we're going, yeah, you fuck up those people trying to kill you. And then when we find out it's the only way to reset things, we go, well, well, okay, yeah, I mean, go kill them. No, get them. You got to go find them all and get them. Yeah. <laughs> and then we see, you know, we see alternate Jesses off to the side of the ship fighting. I don't know about you, but I'm just like, well, that's inconsequential to yeah. us. I don't care what, what the outcome yeah. of that is. Right. But anytime our Jess, you know, I'll root for her through anything. And it's just, it's one of the powers of that kind of, not first person perspective, but you follow a hero character. Sure. You get their side of things. You want them to win. Even if they're in the exact position you hated the people for at the beginning of the movie. <laughs> right. And even with the knowledge of, oh, well, that person's just, you found your way out of their boat, but they just, I'm sorry, they have to kill you to reset their timeline. You're still thinking, well, fuck that. I don't yeah. want them to shoot me. They're a terrible person. Right. And then seeing those same scenes over and over from a different perspective so is cool. great filmmaking wise, so too. Good. Yeah. It's like, um, you know, rewatching a movie. So many times we've talked about that Matrix idea of by the end you get it all. Mm -hmm. You watch it again, you pick up more stuff. Right. Triangle lets you do that all at once. Right. It goes, all right, we're going to get through this first loop together. And then we're going to go back through and kind of fill you in on what were the other voices? Why was this person here? Hey, alternate history. You didn't know that this person was actually... During these events, this person was standing off behind that thing, but they were. And seeing those alternate kind of takes is really, really cool. I mean, uh, going back into a movie after getting a reveal in the end and finding those Easter eggs, it's one of my favorite things you can do in a movie like yeah. this. And for the movie to bring you through that experience as part of the film's narrative, I just think it's really great. Yeah. The last little image I can think of is that uh, that bird yeah. that you see overhead. And that's another big one for the movie. Yeah. It's like a vulture, you know, sensing what's to come. Uh huh. You wonder why it's following them around as if there's going to be a bunch of death, as if it's an ominous sign. And they use it to play into the chronology a little bit. Sure. But they also use it, you know, they use birds to cover one of the dead bodies. Yeah. They use the... The pile of dead birds. I guess piles are another. Yeah. <laughs> that is kind of another image of the movie I like a lot. I think, yeah, the the idea of piles represents to me, and this is going to sound really pretentious, so, you know, put on. That's fine. Get a scoff ready, but it represents to me the futility of fighting a fixed timeline. Sure. I didn't even think about that, but that's true. You You and I often talk about things that involve, like films that involve time travel and whether or not you can go back in time and alter the future. Mm -hmm. But this film is very much set in the notion that this is how this will play out unless something changes, but nobody can change it because nobody knows how it's playing out right. until the right. pile has already been added to. Yeah, The bird falls into the pile, and you go, uh, oh, yeah, because there, there's no way you're ever going to not hit that bird. That bird's right. going to get hit in every timeline. Uh -huh. You may be driving slower or faster or looking in a different place or in a different lane, send the bird, bird a little bit you know, further to the left or to the right. But the reality is you can't stop that bird. You can't stop Sally from dying. There's sure. just no rationale that you will have prior to her getting stabbed, shot, whatever the hell you want to do. Right. Your rationale will not be able to affect the outcome of these, these beings. Yeah, the horror in that isn't even in how futile it is so much as the fact that it's even happened before. Right. You know, I think just, just coming upon that moment and going, oh, I thought I've outsmarted this, but there have been people who've gotten to this point and hit the bird before. Right. You know, I don't know if every single move, I mean, we see that they break the timeline here and there. Sure. We see that things change. Yeah. But the fact that we change so many things and we really feel like this is our hero timeline. Mm -hmm. This is the one where we defeat it. Exactly. And there's still people who made it this far, got off the boat and hit the bird. You just go, oh, fuck. I have no idea if I'm doing right. you know, really well or extremely poorly. Every decision you make, you go, is this the decision that the previous Jess made? <laughs> yeah, right, right. I wanted to talk a little bit about the science fiction elements the uh the intricacies of the timeline but it's hard to do that without graphs on our show so this is my best 
But the first thing I wanted to mention is I thought the movie uses a really interesting formula in answering our questions. Mm-hmm. Uh, it does this this kind of it's kind of a a who, what, where, when, why approach to things. Mm-hmm. You're discovering the characters in the beginning. You're doing your character driven. How do these people's relationships play together? How do they know each other? But as soon as any sense of urgency kicks in, then we find this boat and we immediately go, what is this thing? What kind of situation are we in? And we get our moment of sci-fi and it becomes, where are we? Right. What time are we? You know, right. the when question of, is this time travel? I no longer care about where we are on the planet. The when we are on the planet is a much bigger problem, Mm -hmm. and we don't even get a chance to relax into that before the fucking why question. Sure. before Which is always the biggest in something like this. Sometimes you avoid it, and you go, we're not here to talk about why. We're just here to play in time travel. We stay at when. But this movie does play around with that a little bit to go, why are people dying? Why is time looping? How do we stop the looping of time? in order to get back to our present whatever. And I thought it was really interesting to see a movie that tackled, you know, as we think more and more about mysteries in the show and psychological thrillers, Mm -hmm. to tackle the big five questions. Sure. And do it really in chronological order. Right. I'm curious if we'll see that, you know, the next time we have a movie where we're trying to solve puzzles, if it Uh kind of works its way through a, a who, what, where, when, why. Just like with The Killing Room, I'm very susceptible to I'm going to solve this before the movie solves it for me. Sure. That's a long-standing goal you've had yeah. uh, since and, I've known you, really. And uh, the thing for me that I kept looking at as a clue, and now in retrospect, I just think is a brilliant reference, is her son has autism and doesn't. he says something along the lines of everything has to be the same all the time. Sure. Yeah. You know, he's got to do the same thing over and over again. Right, right. And I'm sitting there going, oh, this is all in his mind. Oh, he's having a dream. He's going to, no. <laughs> it's I'm, Tommy Westfall universe. Yeah. You think you're in the Tommy Westfall right, universe. Right, exactly. And instead, the film just ends with her going back to say, because the, the brilliant thing the film does there with that rationale is, oh, we'll just kill the kid. And then anybody who thinks it's the kid's dream is an idiot. Yeah, right. <laughs> and so there I sit there I sat as a fool while the film went, no, this is not that. You're being dumb. This is a different right. whole different whole different right. thing, buddy. Yeah, I'm still uh having only seen the movie one time, which is a terrible tragedy. Yeah, me I know. too. I mean, you have to watch it twice in a row, I think. Yeah, it's it's really hard to talk about why this happens or where it begins. mm mm-hmm. Mhm. I get this feeling that it starts post crash. Sure. That there's kind of that taxi, you know, Greek myth fairy uh, driver, I guess in this case. Sure. Who starts around this journey. And there seems to be a lot of really heavy speech that's happening between the two of them, really layered, loaded Mm -hmm. types of, oh, I'll definitely be back. Or are you ready to go? Those, those types of things. That's also hard to think about because you just assume it starts on the boat. Right. You go, oh, we're getting on the mystery boat or we have the mystery storm and Mm -hmm. this is when stuff is getting fucked up. But to think she has that crash and then the taxi drives her away, being one of the most enigmatic points in the movie, I have to go, well, that's probably where the loop starts. Right. But there's a, and I don't want to take credit for this. There's a guy on, uh, I found him through IMDb. His handle on there is Warrior Poet. And if he ever hears this, I want to be so thankful this guy fucking exists. Yeah. When we talked about Primer, we talked about having a kind of flow chart of what the fuck is going on. Sure. This guy has made, he's made a couple things, but uh, the two that I looked over exhaustively uh, right before we started today were the Loop Matrix and the Chronological Breakdown. And here he outlines, the Chronological Breakdown is... Everything that happens in the movie, time-coded, explaining which version of who is doing what, Mm -hmm. what you're actually seeing from the beginning. So it's like watching the movie again, sitting next to a guy who's seen it a thousand times, Right. who can go, oh, well, Jess is battling this version of Jess from this timeline at this point. Oh, see, she lays that object down there, and Jess version whatever picks picks it up later. That's really informative, but then to look at this matrix... This blew my mind wide fucking open. 
first of all, I believe there's four Jesses that uh-huh. we see in the movie. Yeah. I mean, that's a really helpful piece to know there. Right. I guess when you're solving it, that would be my first thing to try and do is go, how many timelines are we actually looking at? Right. The really interesting thing that excited me about seeing this Matrix was he, he or she, I guess, I don't know yeah. who this person randomly from the internet we're now doing a show about is, but uh, numbers these in the occurrence that they believe we're actually seeing. So our Jess, we know, is not the first one, right? nor the second or probably third. In fact, the pile of bodies might be a good indication of how many there have been. Sure. So uh, this person from IMDb believes that we are on the 70th Jess. Mm -hmm. And what we actually see in the movie, I believe, is uh, 68, 69, 70, 71, and 72. It might go as high as 73, actually. Yeah, at the end, I guess it would be she'd be becoming the seventy third Jess uh-huh. when she goes off on the boat to do this loop again. So this loop has happened probably seventy three times, maybe I don't know. Who even knows if it's her fucking loop? Like it could be anybody's loop. Who knows? Right. Who knows where it starts or ends? These are questions I have for next viewing. But to show up and kind of know, all right, how many Jesses are on the boat at any given moment? Is it an infinite number or is it a finite number? And the other crazy thing is they don't all start and end in one loop. Right. Right? Because our Jess survives, what, three or four loops, I sure. guess. Yeah. So you also get this moment of what, uh, again, I'll just be transparent in crediting people from the forums for what I think is a great name. They call this character Mean Jess, uh-huh. which is the Jess you see with blood on her face that kind of shows up, takes off you know, the mask, uh-huh. and goes, follow me. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, just the, that sort of seasoned, been here forever, doesn't give a fuck about anybody. And that does not seem like our Jess by the end of the movie. Right. You know, she's not that hardened and she's been through maybe three loops. Uh huh. So it's possible that this other Jess we're seeing, maybe she's from, you know, 40 loops ago. Yeah. Maybe she's been surviving on this boat, picking everybody off, trying to get answers. Yeah. And we're seeing her encounter, you know, the one time she fucked up. Yeah. And she's out. The film was made by a guy named Christopher Smith. He did, uh, in 2004, he did a movie called Creep, which I think would be really uh, worth looking at for us sometime in the future. Definitely something I'm going to try and check out. But God, just Triangle, I'm so excited about that. I Anytime I finish a movie and I want to watch it again and again and take notes yeah. <laughs> several more times, I, that's really exciting to me. We have a website. It's doublefeatureshow.com. And you can write to us about the enigma of either of these movies, uh, particularly what the fuck is happening in Triangle or what the fuck happened in the actual CIA declassified events that The Killing Room is based on. <laughs> that is doublefeatureshow at gmail.com. I also wanted to thank our executive producers, uh, Lucas Draval, Mike Shaw, Enrique Dust, and Eric Tachek. Um, we are going to, of course, be around for an entire another year at least. Yeah, so we're going to keep doing... Uh, uh, thanks to these people. Keep doing movies, I guess. We, this is difficult. This was difficult. This was difficult to find an entire year of movies in advance. Yeah, it was hard making the schedule all at once. But also, it seemed like, you know, we've... We usually do the schedule and have a bunch of holes in it that we Mm -hmm. can kind of fill in throughout the year as we find exciting things to watch. Right. And this time it it feels like the holes uh, kind of closed up pretty quickly. Right. Yeah. So what are we doing next time? Next time we're going to fill in the holes by doing Clerks and Super 8. Um, Two great directors that go great together. (laughs) Yeah, we'll find out about that. Uh, Watch more fucking film. Bye.